Hi, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to introduce uh, the cast of characters that we will use uh, uh, next time to formulate actions which are invariant under non abelian gauge transformation. So in particular, I will focus on uh, fields. I will uh, call phi my field. Uh, you can think of it as a, a scalar field, and it will transform in a representation of the group G. This representation of the gauge group can uh, either be reducible or irreducible. And if the representation is reducible, namely it's the direct sum of a, a multiple uh, irreducible representation, we can think of this as uh, describing uh, several fields. And phi could be a scalar or a, a spinner. It doesn't matter for what I'm going to say today. And next, once we have fields, we would like to define their gauge covariant derivatives. d mu of phi, which should transform in the same way as the field under a gauge transformation. And hidden inside this uh, gauge covariant derivative uh, will be a gauge field a mu, out of which we'll then construct uh, its uh, field strength f mu nu. And for all these objects, uh, we'll uh, look at their gauge transformations. And then next time we'll use uh, all these objects and their transformation properties to construct the uh, actions which are invariant under uh, gauge transformations, finite or infinitesimal. All right, let's get started. I will be more general later, uh, but let's start easy. And let's assume that uh, our Lie group G, which we use con to construct the gauge group, uh, is uh, a classical uh, group. So one of those matrix groups that I introduced at the end of uh, the previous lecture. And for instance, uh, you could uh, have in mind the SUN. And uh, also for simplicity, our field phi will transform uh, in the fundamental representation, which say for SUN would be the n-dimensional uh, uh, representation. So phi is a vector with the n components. And since uh, classical groups are uh, matrix groups and phi is in a fundamental representation, what this really means is that uh, the gauge transformation of phi viewed as a vector is that phi goes into its gauge transform, which is obtained by multiplying the group element G, which is a matrix uh, times the vector phi. And reminder, the group element is exponential of I times a Lie algebra element, which I'll call alpha A TA in the basis of generators TA. So here phi is a vector. If we're thinking of the fundamental representation of SUN is a, a vector with n components, TA, the matrix. If we think of uh, SUN, TA will be an uh, n by n Hermitian matrix. It's a uh, generator of the Lie algebra. And the group element G acts on phi by matrix multiplication. And recall uh, phi is a function of uh, space time. And also, since we're considering gauge transformations, which are local, g is a function of space time, which means that the parameters alpha uh, a are uh, um, also functions of space time. But uh, I will not uh, write this uh, coordinate dependence uh, explicitly. OK, so this is our field phi and its uh, gauge transformation. The first thing that we'd like to do is define its covariant derivative. which is covariant under gauge transformation since 6.23. I'll define it as, as in the U1 case, d mu phi is a partial derivative of phi with respect to x mu minus i a mu, the gauge field times phi, where the gauge field a mu 
is now a matrix. And as we'll see later, it really is an element of the Lie algebra of uh, capital G. So it will be a permission matrix, uh, which is also traceless. And so that means that we can write it as a mu a t a in the basis of generators. And to ensure that this uh, uh, covariant derivative is really covariant, we'll require uh, under gauge transformation, uh, a non abelian uh, gauge transformation. I wrote earlier here. The gauge covariant derivative of phi transforms in the same way as phi, namely by multiplication by the group element G. And as in the U1 case, uh, it's uh, useful to view the gauge covariant derivative uh, as a, a differential operator. Let me write d mu by itself as partial derivative with respect to x mu minus i a mu. And now this is a matrix valued differential operator. It's a differential operator because of the derivative. It's matrix valued because we have uh, a mu, which is a uh, uh, matrix. And in fact, in order for uh, um, the object to make sense, uh, this uh, derivative uh, really multiplies the identity. A calligraphic uh, one is, uh, uh, in this case, a n by n uh, identity matrix. And I'll typically omit uh, the identity. In the notation, although I'll uh, restore it when it's useful huh, to understand what is going on. Just a side comment here for a more mathematically minded student. Uh, if this comment helps you, then uh, uh, please read it. If it confuses you, you can ignore it. Uh, really, the way to write uh, the covariant derivative is in terms of a tensor product. Namely, you'd have the partial derivative tensor product with the identity matrix minus i say, a mu a, which are say functions of x, tensor product with t a, which are also matrices, the element of the uh, matrix Lie algebra, which acts uh, uh, on uh, the tensor product of two vector spaces. So the derivatives and the multiplication by a mu a of x act, uh, say, on uh, in our case, we can think of smooth functions, C infinity, and uh, to be precise, those are defined in a patch. So this is true locally. So these are smooth functions in a patch. And the matrices, uh, the identity matrix or the uh, generator TA of the Lie algebra acts on the vector space of the fundamental representation. This would be. Uh, in our case, say for SUN uh, uh, group, this would be an n-dimensional uh, vector space for the fundamental representation. And then you, when you apply this gauge covariant derivative, uh, uh, if you follow carefully the rules of um, tensor products, uh, uh, that's how you get the correct result. But uh, in practice, uh, we probably don't need to worry about uh, this level of formality because anyway, the derivative uh, partial derivative with respect to x mu and the identity matrix commute. Uh, a mu a of x are really uh, functions. They commute with the matrices TA, so uh, there shouldn't be any confusion, hopefully. Anyway, let's get back to our train of thought. And I said that uh, if I define the covariant derivative uh, uh, as a differential operator in equation 6.24, then uh, we require that it transforms as follows under a gauge transformation. Namely, the gauge covariant derivative as an operator should transform into G, the group element, times d mu, the gauge covariant derivative, times G inverse, the inverse group element. Incidentally, this is the adjoint action of uh, the group G on uh, d mu, uh, thought of as uh, an element, uh, as a differential operator, which is valued in the Lie algebra. So 
we might say that uh, the gauge covariant derivative transforms in the adjoint representation. And reminder, the reason why we want uh, this uh, gauge transformation is that then when we act uh, with the mu on phi, which is mapped uh, into G times phi, then uh, we get that the mu phi goes to G times the mu phi. Okay, so now let's uh, see what uh, the gauge transformation property 6.28 for the gauge covariant derivative uh, means uh, in terms of uh, the gauge field. We did that exercise uh, for a U1 uh, gauge group uh, last week. So let's repeat it now. For now, G is a general uh, group uh, element say, of a classical matrix uh, Lie group. In terms, of the gauge field. What this means is that uh, d mu, which was a uh, partial derivative with respect to x nu minus a, a mu, goes into its gauge transformed, which will be partial derivative with respect to x mu minus i times a prime mu, the gauge transformed version of the gauge field a mu. And 6.28 tells us that this is equal to g times a gauge covariant derivative, d mu minus i a mu. G inverse. All right, now let's expand this out uh, as we did in the U1 case. First of all, let's take care of the derivative, uh, partial derivative with respect to x nu here. That can do uh, two things uh, when it acts to everything to its right, either it acts to G inverse, uh, in which case it produces G times the derivative of G inverse, which multiplies everything that comes uh, to its right or everything that this operator is applied to. Or the derivative goes through G inverse and acts on uh, whatever uh, the operator acts on. So we get in that case G times G inverse times derivative, uh, partial derivative with respect to X mu. And then we have the term which involves the gauge field A mu, but now the gauge field uh, A mu is a matrix, G are group elements, so we can't uh, any longer assume that G and A mu uh, commute. So we can simply rewrite this uh, as uh, minus I G A mu G inverse but we cannot pass G or G inverse through a mu. So important G and a mu do not commute uh, and the order matters. Okay, and now if I look at the second uh, term uh, in this expression, I have G and G inverse, uh, the multiply so the identity, we can cancel that out. And now we can compare this final result with uh, the initial expression here on the right-hand side. And by uh, the comparison, we will get uh, the gauge transformation of a mu. So now we see that the gauge field transforms as follows. A mu goes to a prime mu, which is uh, G A mu G inverse plus I G times a partial derivative with respect to X mu of G inverse. Or alternatively, I can rewrite the second term as minus I partial derivative with respect to X mu of G uh, times G inverse. And here to go from the first line to the second line, We've used the fact that uh, the derivative of the identity matrix is one because the identity is a constant, but the identity matrix can be written as uh, G times G inverse. And now I, if I apply the Leibniz rule, I get D mu G, which multiplies G inverse plus uh, G, which multiplies uh, D mu of G inverse. So that gives you an identity that allows you to go from the first to the second line of 630. And now let me make a couple of remarks. So the first term in the gauge transformation 6.30 of the gauge field, uh, namely G A mu G inverse, is simply the adjoint action. of the Lie group on an element of its Lie algebra. So a mu, the gauge field is an element of the Lie algebra. And so there is a, a natural adjoint action of the Lie group on it, uh, which is a conjugation by uh, the group element G. 
And that's uh, the first term uh, of the gauge transformation, say here on the right-hand side of 6.30. Uh, on the other hand, there is also a second term. Let me call that a direction term. Involving uh, the derivative. And that's uh, going to be the non-abelian analog of the shift uh, d mu alpha that we obtained for a U1 gauge field. This will become clearer later when I, I describe the infinitesimal gauge transformation of the gauge field in mu. But let's keep in mind that for a gauge field, there are always these two terms. One is the adjoint action, and the second term is the derivative term. Very good. We started with our field phi, which transformed in the fundamental representation. Then we introduced a gauge covariant derivative uh, of this field phi. Uh, and require that this gauge covariant derivative uh, transformed uh, under gauge transformation exactly in the same way as phi. That's why we call the derivative covariant. And uh, finally, we said that in the process of constructing this gauge covariant derivative, we introduced the gauge field A mu. And so we worked out the gauge transformation of the gauge field A mu. Now, finally, in analogy with the U1 case, we want to define the field strength uh, F mu nu of the gauge field. Remember, for U1 theory, this is the object that contained the, the physically observable electric and magnetic field. And uh, we saw in the U1 case that a nice way to define uh, the field strength is in terms of the commutator of two uh, gauge covariant derivatives. So let's try to generalize this definition now. So we define F mu nu, the field strength as I, the commutator of D mu, D nu. And the uh, gauge covariant derivatives are differential operators. So now we, uh, here we should also view F mu nu as a, an operator. which acts on uh, everything to its right. But uh, uh, as we find in a second, this operator turns out to be multiplicative. Namely, it's just a function, uh, well, a matrix value of the function of X, but it simply acts uh, by multiplication. no differentiations are involved. Still, it's very convenient to, this, uh, to define uh, the field strength F mu nu in this way as a commutator of two gauge covariant derivatives because uh, this uh, uh, clarifies immediately its uh, transformation properties under gauge transformation. Indeed, uh, I claim that uh, essentially by construction under gauge transformation and on abelian gauge transformation that we have introduced above, we'll find that the field strength will again transform by the adjoint action of the group G element G F mu G inverse. And remember, in the U1 case, uh, F mu nu was uh, invariant under gauge transformations or gauge invariance. And indeed, in that case, uh, uh, everything commutes. There are no matrices around, so we could uh, pass uh, G or uh, G inverse through F mu nu and uh, simply get that F mu nu is equal, goes to F mu nu under gauge transformation. But now uh, F mu nu will also be a matrix, so uh, it will not commute uh, with the group element G, which is uh, also a matrix. All right, let's uh, quickly go through the proof of this statement. I simply use the definition 6.32. So F mu nu is I commutator of gauge covariant derivatives d mu and d nu. And this under a gauge transformation will go to the gauge transform field strength F prime mu nu, which is I times the gauge transform version of uh, d mu, namely g d mu g inverse commutator with uh, g d nu g inverse, which is the gauge transform version of d nu. And now we can expand out uh, uh, the commutator and that essentially the G inverse uh, G, which are sandwiched between the two gauge covariant derivatives will uh, uh, multiply to the identity and we can take out uh, G uh, 
to the left and G inverse to the right, and get the I G times the commutator of D mu D nu G inverse. And this is simply G times the original fixed strength F mu times G inverse, which uh, proves a uh, claim in 6.33. Okay, good. The field strength F mu is not a uh, gauge invariant as it was uh, in the U1 case, uh, but it's a covariant and it transforms uh, nicely in a simple way, uh, which will turn out to be the adjoint action of the Lee group. Uh, more about it uh, in a couple of minutes. Okay, now let's go back to the definition 6.32 and let's calculate the commutator on the right hand side to read off uh, what the field strength is in terms of the gauge field A mu. And I claim that uh, if you calculate the commutator in 6.32, we find uh, that uh, the field strength as a matrix valued function is given by the partial derivative with respect to x mu of a nu, the gauge field, which is a, a matrix valued function minus. Uh, partial derivative with respect to x nu of a mu. So, so far, everything is the same as uh, in the case of a gauge group uh, equal to u1, except that now a nu, a mu, and therefore f mu nu are matrices. But then it turns out that there is an extra term, which is minus i, the commutator of a mu and a nu. This is equation 6.34. All right, let's also prove this. We'll use uh, the definition of f mu in terms of a commutator of the gauge covariant derivatives. Let me write it in this way minus i times f mu, the commutator of d mu, d nu to gauge covariant derivatives. Now I'll write uh, the gauge covariant derivatives as a uh, or uh, partial derivative minus i a mu, partial derivative with respect to x minus i a nu. And if you want to be careful about uh, all uh, the matrices, uh, uh, let me do it in this exercise. So let me also write that. Uh, the identity matrix here. Or if you want to be even uh, more careful and you want to write everything uh, um, using tensor products, uh, uh, be my guest. Okay, so now we need to calculate this commutator. Each entry has uh, two terms. So if we expand out the commutator, we'll get uh, four terms in total. So the first term will simply be commutator of the two derivatives. The second term is minus i, the commutator of the derivative with respect to x nu with a nu, then we have minus i commutator of a mu with derivative with respect to x nu. And finally, we have the commutator of the two gauge fields minus commutator of a mu, a nu. And again, uh, just to be precise and uh, uh, so that we don't get confused, let me also write uh, all the identity matrices uh, which go together with the derivatives. All right, and now we need to calculate these uh, four commutators. So the first commutator is simple, uh, it's equal to zero, just because uh, we assume that uh, the field strength here acts on a smooth function, so derivatives uh, will commute, uh, identity matrices will also commute, so this is zero, or to be precise, it's uh, the zero uh, matrix. Then we have the second term, which is the commutator of uh, the operator derivative with respect to x nu times identity with the, uh, the matrix A nu, which is uh, also a function of x. And here we use uh, the rules for commutators of operators. So derivative, uh, uh, the commutator of derivative with the function of x is simply the derivative of that function times the identity. And so here we'll get minus i partial derivative of A nu with respect to x mu. And again, uh, be careful of this. Multiplies uh, the identity matrix, uh, but uh, uh, we can uh, simply drop that. And similarly for the next term, the commutator is the antisymmetric, and so we'll get plus i partial derivative with respect to x nu of a mu. And finally, the last uh, commutator, we keep it as is. There's nothing to simplify there. And so all in all, we get that this is equal to minus i partial derivative with respect to x nu of a nu minus partial derivative with respect to x nu of a mu. And then this, the last term is minus i commutator of a mu, a nu, which is uh, precisely what we wanted to prove. And if you're confused by this uh, manipulations, you could do either of two things. 
If you are very formally minded, uh, it might help to restore the tensor product and uh, follow the rules uh, for a tensor product. But uh, perhaps a down to earth uh, term of understanding what is going on is to simply apply uh, all of the above, which is uh, an operator equation where the operator are uh, matrix valued. So you apply these uh, operator equations to any uh, test function psi, which are vector valued. So there will be functions of x uh, in the fundamental uh, representation. And then you should be able to see that minus i f mu acting on any test function psi of x is equal to uh, the right hand side, uh, which uh, multiplies uh, the same function uh, uh, psi of x, uh, which is really a vector in the fundamental representation. So I recommend uh, uh, doing it that way if you are confused. Okay, now let me go back to 6.33, the gauge transformation of the field strength here. And I'll write down a remark, which uh, I mentioned earlier in words, but it's worth writing it down. The remark is that finite gauge transformation, where I remind you finite just means that we're using the group element. 6.33 of uh, the field strength. Namely, that was f mu under gauge transformation transformed into g f mu g inverse is by the adjoint action of the Lie group, which is uh, where uh, g the gauge transformation lives on the Lie algebra, which is where f mu the field strength lives. And this means really that the field strength f mu nu naturally transforms in the adjoint representation. There will be an exercise to clarify this at the end of the lecture. All right, so far I described uh, the gauge transformation of uh, the field phi, which is transformed in a fundamental representation, and then of the gauge covariant derivative d mu and the field strength, which is transformed in the adjoint representation. And uh, uh, along the way, we also have the gauge transformation of the gauge field a mu, which was essentially the one of the adjoint representation plus the correction term, which involved uh, the derivative. So those were uh, transformations, uh, so-called finite transformations, where we act uh, with an element of the Lie group uh, G. So now, Here's an exercise 14, which I recommend uh, going through. And the exercise is about working out what happens when uh, the group element is close to the identity. And so we'll call that an infinitesimal uh, gauge transformation. So all that means is that uh, parameters alpha a would be much smaller than one. So let's recall that the group element is exponential of i Li algebra element of alpha a t a. The Li algebra of the uh, group G was uh, the tangent space uh, to the identity. So that describes the uh, transformations which are infinitesimally close to the identity. And I'll call uh, the Li algebra element uh, alpha. And now we, Assume that alpha is very small, so we can Taylor expand and say to first order we get uh, the identity plus i alpha plus order alpha square. So the exercise is to carry on with the Taylor expansion of all the expressions that I wrote earlier to leading order in alpha, which is an element of uh, the Lie algebra of the group G and I ask you to show that the resulting infinitesimal gauge transformations or rather let's consider this infinitesimal gauge variation so the transformation is the identity plus uh, the here the infinitesimal variation of the fields and Take the following form for phi, the infinitesimal transformation was simply i, the algebra element alpha times phi. This is the statement uh, that phi transformed in the fundamental representation of the Lie algebra. For the gauge field, 
we get, uh, first of all, the adjoint action now of the Lie algebra on itself. So that's I commutator of alpha with the gauge field A mu. Both are Lie algebra elements. And then there was this correction term, which now for infinitesimal uh, transformation is simply the derivative uh, of the gauge parameter alpha. And so we could say that this is an adjoint. Uh, the first term is uh, what we expect for the adjoint representation of the Lie algebra. Again, more about this uh, in an exercise at the end of the lecture plus a, a correction term, which is a derivative term. And the derivative term is the one that we already encountered in the case in which a mu was a, a U1 gauge field. And finally, from the gauge transformation of uh, the gauge field a mu, or from the transformation of the gauge covariant derivative, we can work out the gauge transformation of the field strength f mu, which is simply by the commutator of alpha, the gauge parameter with the field strength f mu which tells us that the uh, f minu, the field strength, really transforms in the adjoint representation of the Lie algebra. OK, these points uh, that I just mentioned are important, so let me write them down clearly as remarks. First remark is that uh, the field strength f minu transforms in the adjoint representation uh, of the Lie algebra under infinitesimal gauge transformations. This is not really a surprise because we saw earlier that under finite uh, gauge transformation by group element, uh, f minu transform in the joint representation of the group uh, G. Uh, the second remark was about a mu, the gauge field, that doesn't quite transform in the joint representation. because of the derivative correction that we already encountered. When the Lie algebra was that of uh, U1. So I should warn you at this point that uh, people often say that the gauge field a mu transforms in the adjoint representation. And I might uh, also say that uh, later on in the future, but that's really an abuse of terminology because there is really the uh, extra derivative term. And final remark is that the, the gauge, while the gauge field does not uh, uh, quite transform in a representation uh, of the Lie algebra of the gauge group, uh, the gauge covariant derivative d mu does transform in the joint representation. So its uh, variation uh, would be I commutator of alpha with the uh, mu. All right, we introduce quite a bit of uh, formalism. We consider for simplicity uh, gauge group G, which was a classical gauge group, uh, which is represented by matrices with a group composition being matrix multiplication. And we consider fields phi transforming in the fundamental representation Namely, the group, uh, the gauge group element was acting simply by matrix multiplication of this vector. And we worked out uh, the gauge transformation of the field phi and then uh, of the gauge field mu and its field strength at mu under uh, both finite and infinitesimal gauge transformations. Now that we've done that, uh, we can uh, generalize uh, to the case in which phi uh, is uh, an element of uh, any uh, representation, not just the fundamental representation. And similarly, the gauge group need not really be a classical uh, uh, group, uh, even though uh, we will always work with those groups uh, in the rest of the course. So let me outline uh, what changes if we generalize uh, to phi an r-dimensional vector transforming uh, in an R-dimensional representation R of the Lie group G. From what you've learned in the first term and what I've reviewed last time, you won't be surprised to hear that uh, all you have to do is uh, replace uh, the group element G, which acted by matrix multiplications uh, in previous formula. by its uh, abstract action uh, 
on phi in uh, representation R, which is uh, um, by matrix multiplication. by representation matrix uh, R of G, which is uh, exponential I alpha A, the usual uh, uh, H parameters and the Lie algebra generator TA now in representation R under which uh, phi transforms. So all we have to do is replace G replace a phi, uh, which was an n-dimensional vector by our dimensional vector and replace G, which was a, an n by n matrix by the representation matrix R of G, which is R by R. For instance, whenever we see d mu phi, if phi now transforms in the uh, R-dimensional representation, I will still write this as a partial derivative with respect to x mu minus i a mu times phi, but really what I mean here is that this is the partial derivative with respect to x mu minus i a mu a times the generator is pa now in representation r acting on phi. And if you want to be careful and uh, restore the identity matrix, here you would have an identity matrix, which is now an r by r identity matrix. Now, if you want to be super careful, you could specify that the covariant derivative d mu here acts in a representation r, and you could write something like this. And here on the right-hand side, the pH field mu acts in the representation R. You're welcome to do that, but in practice, nobody does that. The way these uh, equations are usually interpreted is simply that first you specify the representation in which phi transforms. So here it's uh, the R-dimensional representation. And then uh, you understand uh, the gauge field acting on them and the gauge covariant derivative acting on them to be in the appropriate representation. Okay, so this was for the gauge covariant derivative. And now suppose, uh, let me give you just another example. Suppose that you have uh, the field strength F mu nu multiplying phi. This will really be using the definition of the field strength uh, F mu nu. Say this is I times the covariant derivative D mu D nu acting on phi, where the covariant derivatives acting on phi in the R dimensional representation are defined in the previous equation. And if I expand this out, uh, this means uh, I partial derivative with respect to x mu of a mu minus the nu of a mu minus i commutator of a mu a mu all acting on phi and again as in equation 6.38 here all the objects which act on phi which transforms in a fundamental represent, representation are understood to be in, um, valued in the Lie algebra of the, the r dimensional representation so in practice if you want to expand everything in components you would write this as i partial derivative with respect to mu of a nu a. This eventually will multiply the eighth generator t a in representation r and, and act on phi. And for the other two terms, we'll get minus the new a mu a. And for the third term, we have a commutator. And here, since we're expanding the basis of generators of the Lie algebra, I can use uh, the structure constant and write this as. Uh, plus f, uh, I guess uh, I'm writing a mu as a mu b db and a nu as uh, a nu say c cc. And in fact, all these are in the representation r. And so then uh, I use the Lie algebra, uh, then I use the Lie bracket and the Lie algebra and I get that this is structure constant f b c a times a mu b a nu c. And to be totally clear, let me write explicitly that uh, it is always understood that uh, if phi is in a representation R, then uh, a mu phi really means uh, a mu in a representation R. So that's a mu a generator T a in representation R uh, times phi and similarly f mu nu phi can also be expanded in the basis of generators of the representation under which phi transforms. 
And let me just mention that similarly, it's uh, customary to simply write uh, G5 for the abstract action of the group element G on phi in the appropriate uh, representation. which in practice is the multiplication of the representation matrix R of G um, times the R dimensional vector five. And let me also write down what this looks like uh, in components of the vector spaces uh, underlying uh, the representation. So say, so we have a mu phi, a mu uh, phi is really a vector. We'll have indices i running from one to the dimension of the representation. So what this really means is uh, a mu a times the generator TA in the representation R that's as we've written in 6.40, but this is really an R by R matrix with elements say I, J, and this is contracted with phi J. This is really matrix multiplication. And so on for all the other formula. So we, you can write uh, all indices say as in 6.41, this will have a vector space uh, indices for the representation and indices for the Lie algebra, or you could write it uh, as in the right-hand side of 6.40, where the vector space indices for the representation of phi are implicit, but the Lie algebra indices are explicitly, or you could write it fully implicitly as in the left-hand side of 6.40, where uh, none of the indices are explicitly written. Good, I think uh, that's all I wanted to tell you today. Let me just conclude by assigning uh, two exercises. The first exercise will be exercise 15 in the problem sheet. We're asking to show that if the Lie group G that we base our gauge group on is U1, then the previous formula reduce to those that I introduced in chapter five. And please do that both for uh, charge one and for general uh, charge Q representations of U1. That's just a check that uh, what you're doing is uh, a natural generalization of the U1 or a billion case. The next exercise, uh, exercise 16 is about uh, the adjoint representation. And I made a number of comments that various objects like the field strength transformed in the adjoint representation and so on. So to familiarize yourself, I've written exercise 16, which goes as follow. So now consider a field phi, for instance, a scalar field, which transforms in the adjoint representation of the gauge group. This uh, will be useful later on in the term with components phi A, where A runs from one to the dimension of the adjoint representation, which is, as we have seen, the dimension of the Lie algebra. Then, uh, first of all, I ask you to show that uh, A mu times phi, the gauge field times phi in the adjoint representation, and now we take a component A of this object, takes the following form, I, F, B, C, A, A mu, B, phi c, and similarly for f mu phi. And in part two, let phi be an element of the Lie algebra with components phi a, so that's phi a and p a generators. And similarly, as you know, the gauge field is a mu a, generators TA and the field strength is component F mu nu A TA. Now I would like to, you to show that 
the gauge field a mu times the field phi. And this is an object that in the adjoint representation. So it has indices A as above. And now let's contract these indices with the generators and sum over A. And I claim that this is simply given by the commutator of the matrix A mu with the, the matrix phi. If you're uh, dealing with matrix groups or more generally the Lie bracket of the uh, Lie algebra element A mu and the Lie algebra element phi. And similarly for F mu nu, phi. So the joint representation is uh, realized uh, in terms of commutators of matrices or Lie brackets of elements of the Lie algebra more generally. And now that we have this, uh, you can also easily show that therefore, so if we have phi, now a Lie algebra element that is capital phi, and we take its uh, covariant derivative d mu. The covariant uh, derivative also acts by commutator. So this would be the standard partial derivatives minus i commutator of uh, a mu with phi. And similarly, if I take the commutator of uh, the two covariant derivatives d mu d nu and uh, they now act on phi, and I should say what I write here on uh, the left-hand side really means uh, a mu phi a d a, and here it means uh, commutator d mu d nu phi a d a. And again, this can be written in terms of a commutator of the field strength f mu nu with phi, the Lie algebra element or matrix. In the future, we'll essentially always use either the fundamental representation or the adjoint representation. And so remember, the algebra elements act on uh, the fundamental representation by multiplication and on uh, a joint representation by commutators. All right, that's all for today. Please uh, um, attempt these exercises. And then next time I'll use everything that we've learned today to formulate uh, actions uh, which involve uh, the gauge field A mu and possibly charge fields phi, which are invariant under gauge transformations. All right, see you in person next Monday. Have a good weekend, bye.